Welcome to Real Talk, Real Estate Discussions with Andrew Kirsch. In each episode, Andrew interviews industry leaders. We'll hear their real-time opinions on today's market, their background and unique career highlights, and guidance for newcomers into the industry. You can find this show at skalalkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Now here's the host of Real Talk, Andrew Kirsch. Episode 16 of Real Talk. Well, there is so much talk about the capital markets and the illiquidity of capital markets across the entire capital stack from senior debt, MES, preferred equity, common equity, uh, and so much talk as to when the markets are going to open up. And so I thought it would be appropriate to have Malcolm Davies and Zach Strait, co-founders of Way Capital, to come on to Real Talk and discuss what they're seeing from their perspective, the types of deals they're doing, the types of capital that is truly open for business, not the capital that says they're open for business, but they're really not open for business. Um, You know, Malcolm and Zach created Way Capital about a year ago, and they are one of the the, the leading uh, firms who provide uh, services to sponsors and borrowers of of you know introducing both capital and debt for transactions that are not commodity driven transactions. I hope you enjoy our conversation with Malcolm and Zach. Hello, welcome to another episode of Real Talk. It is my honor to bring on. Malcolm Davies and Zach Strait, managing partners and founders of Way Capital. Gentlemen, how you doing? Thanks for having us, Kirsch. Doing great. Thanks, Sandra. Man, you guys are so excited to be on Real Talk. I the energy is just <laughs> just palpitating through through the computer screen here. Malcolm and Zach, have you just been up four straight nights and days just working on your clients that you're just trying to just stay awake for this episode of real talk we we we, we don't need the extra energy to stay on for a podcast with you andrew no i i appreciate yeah. it um well for those that are watching on youtube i'm in the middle of a of a way capital uh sandwich with malcolm on one side and zach on the <laughs> other i guess i could say threesome but i don't know if you're allowed to in 2023 but i just did so guys <laughs> First and foremost, I just want to congratulate you on on the success of Way Capital. It's definitely not easy to open up your own shop uh, in any environment, uh, particularly in an environment that we're in now. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted you guys to come on is to talk about today's uh, capital markets. Um, but before we get into what you guys are seeing today, talk about what is Way Capital and why did you guys decide to start your own company? I'll start it. I mean, I've been in the commercial real estate industry for 25 years and, you know, I've always wanted to run and I've actually been an entrepreneur my, that whole time. Uh, you know, I was a real estate developer um, from the early 2000s all the way through the GFC. And as a young developer, uh, I was an individual that um, I think at the time when Lehman Brothers went down, I was 33. Uh, And I remember uh, looking at my portfolio of, you know, $350 million of assets quickly um, going down to $150 million and having personal guarantees and um, realizing I was in a lot of trouble. And I spent those three to four years working out all the problems, buying notes back, um, Chapter 11, Chapter 7 bankruptcies, very difficult things to do at a very young age, relatively. Um, And then figuring out how how to come back. And the reality is over the last... I would say 13 years as a kind of award-winning capital advisor in the last six or seven with Zach. Um, the reality is Way is the person that I was back in the day that I want to represent. Um, you know, Way stands for we are you. Um, and really that means that the the developer, the young Malcolm uh, in, in, 19, in 2008, 2007 would have loved to have had someone like Zach and myself and thus the name of the firm is emblematic of representing those entrepreneurial developers and owners, um, you know, involved in institutional commercial real estate pursuits. And, um, you know, we think that we have not necessarily a, a secret sauce. You know, I don't think that 
you know, myself or Zach are maybe smarter. Maybe we think we're smarter or not, but we really have um, a system. And the system really is one in which um, it takes a lot of resources to um, support the entrepreneurial sponsor. And that means that it's very difficult to pay um, a big institutional uh, commercial real estate platform uh, a big kind of fee to the mothership and represent those clients when it, you need all of the fee really to represent those clients. So 100 cents of every dollar that comes in the door today goes to the people that support the client, doesn't go to pay third party shareholders or service debt. Um, it really goes to, to the individuals that support Zach and myself. And I think that's a big differentiator, uh, particularly when it comes to representing those uh, entrepreneurial sponsors um, in these larger institutional pursuits. Zach, why don't you add on to that? Yeah, um, well, I, I do think I'm smart, by the way, you know, I, I, I and I have to like show it every time in my signature with my JD and my MS, but I wasn't smart enough to get a job for uh, Andrew working as an attorney. Um, no, I, I would. No, do Zach, I think you were actually smarter not to work as an attorney <laughs> and to instead be uh, on, on the brokerage side, because whenever I look at the closing statements and I see the brokerage fees versus the legal fees, I think you made the right <laughs> but Andrew, you make that you know what? I mean, the deals don't close, right? You know, nobody ever talks about the deals that don't close. Oh, but here's the thing, Malcolm. <laughs> haven't you heard of now we're just gonna go like wrestle MMA style? <laughs> haven't you heard of dead deal discounts? And those dead deal discounts are becoming uh the norm uh and higher and higher percentages. So it's like why I don't even get the upside of, of the broker. <laughs> Hey, that's why you become an, the world famous podcaster as you are. That's right. right. This, pay, this pays uh, <laughs> my lifestyle and my wife's lifestyle. Uh, anyway, Zach, we digress, yeah. please. I dovetail off Malcolm's last point. I think when the opportunity arose, you know, after years of working together to kind of build our own brand, um, our own flag, really representing entrepreneurial sponsors doing institutional deals, we thought if we wanted to be true to that, that we had to kind of show our entrepreneurial streaks um, ourselves, which I think we've both had really throughout our careers. Um, I've worked at some big institutions, but at sort of subsidiary businesses that were kind of fledgling. And it was really fun to start those. I uh, started a business of my own. Um, and this is the second time, uh, you know, really getting to do it. And I, I've, I've always loved it. I've been addicted to it. Um, and it's, I think, fortuitous that I was able to find it in a space that I've really grown to love. Um, which, you know, is maybe the road less traveled a little bit, you know, going from attorney um, to eight years on the principal side, you know, three years on the equity side, five years on the debt side, and then to about six or seven years with Malcolm now, and then just really loving the space. So we thought, okay, commitment to it, the ability to build a brand, really focusing on a particular niche in the market um, really led us to way. And I don't think there's another shop out there that's really structured in the way that we are, um, as Malcolm mentioned, where you've got, you know, us and call it, you know, 10 to 12 folks that work for us and, and help on execution with our deals. Um, that was always vitally important to our structure. Um, that's what allows us to produce, you know, a billion or a billion and a half annually. Um, and it's more vitally important to our clients today, uh, I think, than ever before. Uh, because, you know, there were always tough deals. And I think in the environment we're in now, um, almost every deal is a tough deal. And it requires just relentless focus, dedication, those you know, four nights in a row, and I've got a Red Bull here to prove it, of really pushing as hard as we possibly can to get stuff done. Um, and you need resources if you're going to do that, and really if you're going to do anything today. So the ability to build a platform um, that kind of stood for all those things, that had that infrastructure, was um, just an amazing opportunity. And we've, we've had an incredible, I guess, first 10 months um, out of the gate, where we've done, I don't know, a billion one, a billion two, and that time period. So it's really been uh, incredible. Yeah. yeah I'm well, going to plug us too, yeah. Kurt, because, you know, we just found out today that we won Boutique Capital Advisor of the Year by Real Estate Capital USA. So, you know. I love that. Is that, is that why, <laughs> was that the the um, award where I was asked to vote like 5,000 times? Yes, exactly. exactly. Yes, but yeah. There was really only one vote that mattered. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, on, a, on a serious note, congratulations. Um, you know, I, I look at Way Capital and Scar Kirsch, and we really are, you know, running parallel paths as to, um, you know, I don't know, to say disintermediating the 
uh, brokerage, uh, the capital advisory business or the law firm business. But, you know, I would say would it, it was very challenging uh, several years ago uh, for a law firm, for a capital intermediary to break out on their own and play not in a small to midsize uh, uh, world, but in an institutional world, which where Scar Kirsch plays and you guys for sure play in based on the number of deals. And frankly, based on the parties that you guys throw at IMN and uh, NMHC, and I could go on and on and on, the other parties that I don't get invited to. I mean, I, I know how successful you are based on the parties you throw at these conferences. And so the reason why you're so tired, Zach and Malcolm, is because you literally go from conference to conference to conference, throwing these epic bashes. I look, Andrew, there's one thing that we really firmly believe, and there's a there's ethos that we always talk about and there's philosophies, but you know, the the why, you know, everyone asks what kind of your business you're in, and the, the why is, you know, we believe that connections foster pro- prosperity, right? The reality is the more ways we can create connections between uh, individuals and platforms to do deals together, the more successful our clients will be. And, um, you know, going skiing or having a beer together or driving race cars or um, things that you might get you out of your comfort zone. um, We think that those are the types of things that foster those connections in a more meaningful way. And I think, you know, we we firmly believe in that. And you're going to see more and more of that. I will say, you know, you, you have to have a warrior mentality, you know, not, not to get, you know, too detailed about our lifestyle, but I mean, heck, you got to go. I mean, from January 9th to February 23rd, uh, I've been on the road like two thirds of that. I mean, maybe more. And that's just part of the business and how you grow, particularly for all of us that are entrepreneurial and growing platforms. I think you, you've got to take the extra step and the extra effort, make that extra flight. Um, it really pays dividends for your clients. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about at some point, maybe later in the podcast, about balancing family life and travel because you know, my wife thinks I'm on the road like every day and it's probably like <laughs> once a month, but in her mind, it's every day. And you guys, yeah. I know, travel more than I do. So, so love to explore that. So, let's just jump into where we sit now. Uh, we're recording at the end of February, probably be released in early March uh, of 23. And, um, you know, the capital markets are challenging. Um, uh, it's not, you know, it, it's hard to get uh, JV equity interested in anything. Uh, the cost of senior debt has risen significantly. Pref equity is being priced in the mid-teens. So when you're talking to clients today, um, what are you telling them about how to capital, how you can go about uh, assisting them in capitalizing their deals. And I, and I understand that every deal stands on their own and every location is different. And is it a development deal versus a core deal versus a value add deal? So if we just first touch upon it from a macro standpoint, what are you seeing today in the capital markets? Yeah, maybe I'll take it to start and then uh, Malcolm, go ahead. Um, look, it, I think backing up and also touching on something Malcolm said, we've been to probably, I don't know, five conferences in four weeks record attendance at those conferences and and definitely a clear theme that there is capital out there. So I think the first thing we're telling our clients is it's not March and April of 2020. The markets are not completely frozen. Um, You know, with that said, there's less liquidity than there was in 21 and early 22 uh, for sure. But there is still liquidity out there and we're probably marketing a record number of deals and um, it's Pretty amazing the number of fee agreements that we've sent out and those that have been signed, including on $100 million plus transactions um, in the last couple of weeks, um, including one that we just met with a sponsor on this morning. Um, So there's still an appetite among sponsors to get their deals done as well. And I think we're we're lucky in some senses that it's not the back half of 22 anymore, because I think there's been kind of um, a recognition among sponsors about what capital has been saying for the last six months about where interest rates are, at least for now. And so it's a little bit easier to relay the message of where we think, you know, debt might clear or the return metrics that equity is looking for now than it was back half of last year when you really were sort of catching the falling knife of interest rates rising. It's a bad mixed metaphor, but I think you know what I'm saying. So I think when we coach our clients today, we tell them, look, it's not 
the height of like COVID when it first started, there is capital available for, for deals today. It is tougher to access for sure. Um, on the LP equity side, you know, return on cost metrics are up. Most guys want, you know, six and a quarter, six and a half and are stressing exit cap rates for sure. Um, on the debt side, um, proceeds are down, rates are up, you know, DCR matters a lot. Uh, we spent a lot of time watching the 10 year, figuring out what does that takeout look like for bridge and construction financings. But we're still managing to get things done, um, which is which is really kind of amazing. We closed an office loan um, probably second week of January that we've been working on with a while, uh, for a while with a bank at a six and a half percent fixed rate. Um, it was cash flowing, but that's a pretty tough execution today. We closed two land deals, uh, one with you as counsel um, in the last um, month or so, um, and land can reprice faster than other assets, as we know. So uh, again, there's still capital out there. You just kind of have to know where to find it. You've got to take the extra time to make sure you really understand the deal you're working on and then try and coach your sponsors um, appropriately. Um, but but like I said, you're starting to see them come around. A lot of the, um, I think, interest rates, for example, in models that we're seeing now are just not what they were a year ago. You're not seeing guys, you know, wanting 300 over with no sofa floor. That's that's not out there doesn't exist anymore you know guys know where the sofa curve is and and they've sort of adjusted spreads up um you know for times like these and look we also tell them that now is a great time to develop we think and probably a pretty good time to buy too if you can find a deal um you know although like you know 98 percent of people want to buy and only two percent of people want to sell and so that's why you see a big dislocation in the markets but we think that now's a pretty good time to build something because you're going to deliver 18 months, you know, 24 months out from now. And there's probably pretty, pretty limited supply coming online then. I mean, look, the reality is this is not the GFC um, by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, you look at um, just the general economic condition of the U.S. feels pretty strong relative to um, what the GFC felt like, which was a massively um, over levered induced fake uh, financial calamity that we had put ourselves into by over leveraging ourselves. And I think we've had a lot of discipline in the markets over the last few years. And those that discipline, um, I think things that are quite different from years ago. Um, the reality is the globalization of the financial markets has significantly increased over that time period. Uh, also, the allocation of people's investments and their portfolios and how they're allocating to commercial real estate has significantly changed. Um, than it was previously. I think those two items of having much more globalization and the safety of the United States as an investment, and then having others take more money out of the kind of call it the public securities, publicly traded markets, and putting them into commercial real estate through different allocators, um, you be that through you know your RIA who says, I'm gonna get paid on an AUM. It doesn't matter if I'm investing in Euro and in commercial real estate uh, opportunities or if I'm investing in the public markets. Um, the reality is we are doing deals today um, across the board where you know, capital's coming in through um, you know, reinsurance companies out of Bermuda to be our lender on a particular deal, or you know, we're, getting, um, we're helping a group um, go to a crowdfunding company um, to help them go find capital on that avenue. And those are things that I think really influence um, where commercial real estate will ultimately go. Um, we think it's a great industry to be in, a great place to invest. Um, but, you know, we certainly are paying attention to the debt markets, which are really impacting asset values. And that is really where, um, you know, our business is coming because people are not trading their assets per se. They're not selling, like Zach was just referencing. They're coming to groups like Way and saying, hey, we don't want to sell right now. We don't have a good debt structure that's in place for us. So let's figure out a way to get ourselves to the next few years, uh, recapitalize the asset, um, either through the equity or the debt markets, um, and then look at where things are going to be at in two to three or four years from now. I would say on development, I would say it's very difficult because of the cost. However, if you're able to get your deal out of the ground this year, you're going to be delivering two years from now with significantly less competition than you might have if you were delivering, honestly, this year, um, yeah. where it was here to get capital two years ago. So I'll stop there and let you... Take the, take the yeah, no, there's, there's so much to unpack and, you know, we could talk for hours here, but I think we'd lose our uh, listeners and, and I'd lose my two guests here because they need to go to sleep. Um, what are you, are you busier 
today in a fragmented market, in a market where it's just, it's more illiquid than 12 months ago, I guess, yeah, 12 months ago still would have been like the height of just money flowing, um, uh, where, you know, I was busier 12 months mm -hmm. ago, just doing so many closings in a, in a, in a one month period. So, so are you busier now or are you, Maybe, everyone yeah. was doing transactions? Uh, now I'll, you're busier. I mean, look, I'll, I'll do a little bit here and I'll let Zach talk. I mean, I would say because of our structured finance, and we like to say that we like to take an investment banking approach to commercial real estate finance because of the way that we approach the business. In up and down markets, um, we can be valuable for different reasons. And I would say that today we're extremely valuable um, to not only that entrepreneurial sponsor, but also to some extent, even institutional sponsors are now coming to weigh um, because they just do not have the internal resources to handle going to the capital markets to get a deal executed. And I think that makes us a little bit more appealing for groups that even have in-house capital markets expertise, uh, just yeah. simply because it's so time consuming. Um, in that regard, we're, we're, we're actually capturing market share in that, in that realm. And that's because what of I that, assume. Yeah. Yeah. That and because people that, value you more today yes. when it's harder to get capital. A hundred percent. I think there's always going to be a place for groups like us in the markets. Um, you know, the reality is we, we tend to do things that are not commodity driven transactions. Um, and, you know, we help all of our clients meet new equity sources, um, you know, be that co-GP, providing balance sheet support on construction loans, uh, helping them find, you know, family offices to invest in um, some of their opportunities and seeing those um, referrals that we provide. Um, really, it's helpful and it creates long lasting um, bonds, so to speak, because if you can help your clients, not just in the debt markets, but really, really strong in the equity markets, um, it really helps, um, particularly in times like today. Yeah. So yeah. Let me, I guess let me direct this next question to you, Zach, then. Um, uh, you know, we keep hearing uh, in any conversation I'm in, I'm sure you guys are in as well, uh, how much money there's on the sidelines that are ready to pounce. But at the same time, it's not. I mean, it's not a truly liquid market, right? There's a lot of groups who are on the sidelines. So does it really, I guess my question is this, what do you think these groups that are on the sidelines waiting for in order to transact? Yeah, big question, tough question, you know, definitely a theme. Uh, when we, we go out for equity and we do that um, quite a lot and we continue to do that um, even in the face of a, of a tough market, um, I think, you know, the only area or the two areas within equity that we're seeing a bright spot right now are opportunity zone equity. So that's kind of tax driven, not purely real estate driven. There's still a pretty liquid market for that. And there's still probably more capital than there are deals um, right now in that space. That's kind of interesting. And then most of the LP guys have flipped to prep. Um, and so I think that as preferred equity opportunities arise, and we think they will, um, you're going to see a lot of capital deploy into those spaces. But I think there's going to be a lot of competition to do that because you have a mix of the traditional preferred equity providers out there that have always allocated into that space that want to continue to because they like it and they know it. And then you've got your sort of more traditional joint venture equity guys that might be risk off at the moment because they want a six and a half or a seven return on cost or maybe even higher because they're sort of uncertain as to where the dust might settle on deals. And they're like, OK, you know, if instead of taking common equity risk, I can get a a 15 or I can get a, you know, a, a 10 accrued and five current or, you know, and a piece of the apps or something like that, I'm going to go, you know, in, in that direction. So I think that um, as refinancings um, occur or kind of any sort of distressed deals occur, I do think you're going to see the floodgates um, sort of unleash, you know, to the extent that that um, comes around and, and actually happens. Um, if that doesn't, I think it just takes more stability in the interest rate market to sort of, you know, have things reset a little bit. So once once we know that we're kind of at the top and if you look at the curve, um, I guess the curve is pricing in that we are close, if not actually there. Um, and then there's some stability in the 10 year market, which we all kind of thought there was. But now the 10 years sort of gapped out probably 40 or 50 bips. And so that's 
that's a yeah. little scary because that's got a big impact on you know both the permanent construction and bridge markets. So I would say you, you either need sort of a, a volume of distress opportunities to occur, and I think that will cause the floodgates to unleash. And we haven't broadly seen that yet. Or you need more, um, I guess, transparency into are we done with these hikes? And we think we are, but we don't know. Because every time we think we are, we hear about stubbornly high inflation. Or we hear about you know employment that sort of you know uh, comes in much stronger than anticipated, despite what you see going on in the tech space, which is which is a pretty significant contraction um, in employment. So I think you kind of need those two things. But but look on the counter, they're fresh allocations for the year. Um, you know banks can't remain solvent indefinitely without making loans. And, you know, guys on the equity side of the stack need to deploy capital in order to generate um, fees and have any chance at making a promote. So it doesn't mean they're going to just do it willy nilly. But I think that is a kind of valid point that's out there. And we, we've been hearing a lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, we're still seeing things get done, albeit that there is a bit of a liquidity crunch out there. I mean, look, I think the reality is the market, when there's a visibility on the rates, you'll see a lot of running. However, we have we have some things we've got to get through. I mean, I think the elephant in the room is going to be what to do with a lot of the floating rate debt that's been originated and placed on assets over the last few years. And, um, you know, you, know, you, you go and look at an at, I mean, we, interest rates, no matter how you play it, if you were not locked into a fixed long term fixed rate, your rate today is double. Um, so, yeah. so let me ask about that, Malcolm, uh, because, you know, people say to me, uh, hey, Kirsch, I assume you are really busy with forbearance agreements, loan modifications, you know, possible starting foreclosures. We're not, you know, right. maybe here and there we've done some extensions and some of them were, you know, short term extensions. And then I think we did one that was a longer term extension for more than a year and our client uh, had to pay down the principal by 10%. But yeah. we're not seeing the flood of forbearance agreements and modifications and lenders pounding their chest like we did 08, 09, and really all the way through 2012 from note sales and you know tapes of loans that were being sold. We're not seeing any of that. Is that, are we the are we at the calm before the storm where we're going to see a lot of that or it's just a different environment and it's just going to be kicking the can down the road and the lenders have no choice but to extend? I mean, look, the reality is my take on it is that you know, we're talking about the regulators and the banks, you know, the underlying capital and all of the debt funds in the U.S. that did a lot of the floating rate bridge debt um, is supported by um, banks that are regulated. And so the question is, what are those regulators going to say to the banks when you come a, come on to a maturity where the loan is at 100 percent LTV? Um, will the regulators allow them to say and actually refinance or uh, extend on a, on a maturity without actually paying down the loan? Uh, I think the answer is they're going to have to absolutely pay down the loans. Um, and in that sense, that leaves the opportunity um, for what Zach was referencing earlier, which is if you are not able to pay down the loans, which I think in today's environment you are, um, because you probably have a lot of liquidity. Um, you probably have made money over the last five to 10 years, which has been an incredible cycle. You're going to start to solve your problems yourself. The question is gonna be when you get to five, 10, 15, 20 assets, and you, all of them are requiring pay downs, you, want, you might wanna to go to another third party source to come in and help you do that. And the question is, how do you do that? You can come in as preferred equity. It can come in as common equity, it can come in as mezzanine. Uh, it can come in as participating equity. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this so that on the maturity, you can either qualify for the extension or you can go in and refinance with a new loan. I think that's where it's going to get very busy. The one thing I do not believe that will happen is I don't believe that we're going to have that situation where a lot of lenders are going to be taking assets back and wanting to foreclose and repeat and lose. Um, we might see that a little bit in the office markets. That's the one area where certainly we're seeing lots of challenges. But I think in some sense, there's a lot of capital that wants to deploy into those opportunities because they look at the basis and say, I'm comfortable with where we're going. Um, and I, I do think that that's one of the also the reasons why the equity markets are kind of turned off right now is that they have absolutely no idea what the exit cap market looks like. And thus, there's no one wanting to transact because is it a six cap? Is it a five cap? 
is it a four cap was what it used to be um you know i think that's some of the challenges that we're going to see ourselves keep working through and we're frankly prepared for being very busy i mean i'm doing a few of these deals right now whereby um, we are able to refinance a loan, but we aren't able to refinance all of the proceeds. Um, we're just able to refinance some of it. And then we're creating a structure where whatever we're not refinancing, we create a split structure with the existing lender who's taking, um, in essence, a participation in the upside of the asset in exchange for a short pay. Um, that's something that, that we're doing today. So yeah. In terms of who are the types of capital providers, whether it's on the debt side, preferred equity, or common equity side, the, the types of groups that you are seeing who are saying, hey, Malcolm, Zach, uh, we want to be at, we are active, we want to transact. So so you don't have to name names, but just more of the, the, the categories and types of groups that are out there. I, I would say almost everybody wants to transact. Who will and won't? I mean, that that takes market knowledge. Um, in the back half of last year, the big banks were out, for example, by and large. Although we happened mm -hmm. to be working on one deal with one big bank that you know was sort of lending money from a wealth management arm it had, and um, we should hopefully close that um, soon. We had another big bank hit us up who was completely out, um, you know, at least in the fourth quarter of last year, and now they're back and they're actually you know doing transaction size on the bridge side that started 30 million, which is pretty small to access a money center bank um, balance sheet. A lot of the regionals that were out worried about um, kind of, you know, slower payoff regulatory scrutiny. A lot of them seem back or at least are telling us they're back now too. They all have math problems. Uh, I don't mean with their existing books, just how they're sizing new deals because they are DCR constrained. So leverage is lower and, and the rates are higher on stuff. But I would say all of them are back. The debt funds seem to be back too. And, and again, five conferences, there were a ton of lenders and equity capital sources there. They all want to figure out a way to do a way to do deals. I mean, the things to really pay attention to is, you know, if, if, if you're a bank, how strong is your depositor base? Is there any regulatory scrutiny on you? You know, how strained are you on payoffs? You know, are you really going to do this deal or not? What is the strength of the relationship with the sponsor? Recourse deposits, things like that start to matter much more than ever before. If you're a debt fund, you know, how strong uh, are you unlevered? How strong are your back leverage facilities? Um, uh, you know, do you need an A note? Um, can we help you find that A note? You know, are you willing to tell us that you need that? Um, and really trying to mitigate as much execution risk as you can, because again, we're in a volatile environment, and I think everybody will tell you that they want to transact and that they have the capital to do so. But it's strength of a relationship, um, both with us and the capital sources, the sponsor and the capital sources, that matter more than ever. I, I think I mentioned this internally. A number of times, but I don't think we're in an arm's length market right now. I think we're in a market where relationships are more critical than ever before and more deals are happening because of connection points that we somehow unearth and relationships that we've been building for a long, long time. And, you know, we have sponsors come to us and say, like, look, if you guys haven't closed a deal with these guys, we'd rather go to the next guy, even if it's yeah. more expensive, because we need to get this done because we got a maturity coming up and we have no idea if an extension is going to be there or we're hard a bunch of money or we've got a JVA lined up and we need to figure out our construction or bridge financing because otherwise we could lose all this capital that we spent sometimes years um, putting together. So I think I think all those guys are back. I think the guys that are admittedly not back yet and where you're still seeing sort of a lot of, you know, hey, we're on hold is kind of the theme of what we've been discussing. And that that's that's common equity. I mean, common yep. equity right now is so confused about how to underwrite a return on cost you know, versus an exit cap rate spread, that it's just really difficult for them to gain conviction about deploying funds, um, with the exception of opportunity zone equity, which, you know, still seems to be out there. Uh, so, so, if, so if common equity is not back, and I agree with you, because we represent a lot of, uh, you know, institutional common yeah. equity providers, and they go to a lot of conferences, and they go to a lot of parties, but they're not, they're not <laughs> transacting. Um, so who is providing, who's stepping in and, and fulfilling that gap? Because if, if the senior lender is tapping out somewhere between 50% and your pref equity is coming in, you see any groups going higher than 80. So are sponsors just needing to come up with their own 
skin in the game more than what used to be just 5% or 10. Now it's closer to 15 or 20% of their own money in order to make deals pencil. But the deal we're doing, we're doing a deal in, in Phoenix right now where, you know, you would, we would have thought it would have been a traditional structured deal before the market shift. And, you know, we've got a construction loan at 60% LTC. We've got a preferred equity provider uh, from 61 or 60.1 to 80%. And then we have a family office going from really 80% up to, you know, 95%. The sponsor is putting in 25% of the equity. So 5% of that, you know, that 20% of the stack, um, you know, that's what, that's how deals are getting done. And I think, and that deal, what's really remarkable is that the the yield on cost, the development yield on cost is probably 70 basis points from where people think the exit cap rate is today, which is extremely tight. The 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 equity doing this deal is a long term and you know, long term a capital investor doesn't want to turn a merchant build. Those are the types of capital from a from a common perspective that are doing deals. Um, however, look, just look around and tell you the transactional volume from either construction financing or development deals that are actually getting done, um, uh, investment sales of deals that are actually selling. And I think the volume is down 65, 60%, something to that magnitude right now from where we were at pre kind of March of 2022, um, which can be expected when you don't have a lot of visibility. And so we're in that, I think you mentioned earlier, it's the calm before the storm. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of stuff we're getting done right now. A lot of these are keeping us very busy. But we are gearing up for what we think is going to be an extremely, extremely busy market going into the second, third, fourth quarters of this year. Because not only are we going to have folks wanting to get their development deals done because we have visibility potentially in the interest rate markets, we're going to have people that have to stabilize themselves, like we mentioned earlier about recapping these deals. Um, but we're also going to have people looking at new strategies and buying stuff traditionally, which is going to be the investment sale activity is going to be, I think, not necessarily all the way back, but it's going to be significantly more than it is right now. And I, I'd add we're probably working on at least four or five deals, some legacy, some that we're pitching on where um, the equity provider has already been identified and has just said, the heck with it. I like this sponsor. I like this asset. I like this market. I understand there's dislocation in the interest rate markets now that require me to deploy more equity than I wanted to. Um, and, you know, maybe if they didn't have those connection points uh, or re-underwriting this deal on a new basis today and hadn't sunk a year or two into it, um, they might not be doing it. But there are definitely those deals out there where, yeah, you're just seeing more equity come in from both the GP and the LP to get the deal done and kind of out of the ground. And they're sort of making peace uh, somewhat, you know, begrudgingly, but it is what it is with where the debt markets are clearing today. And look, Andrew, the, we just went into app on a $42 million LP equity deal um, where we're now going again, construction loan done on a, a 344 unit project. And, you know, what's interesting about that is, yes, it's a qualified opportunity zone uh, project that needs to deploy the capital before the end of June. I think at the end of the day, that's a conviction about the long term prospects about that particular market. And so that's a family office. I think the, the market you said, where, are the, where is the capital coming in from that's not on the debt side and not preferred equity, not mezzanine? It's frankly family offices and it's also, you know, crowdfunding type capital sources where the conviction is from the, the individual investor, not the fiduciary to a pension fund, and endowment and the like, which I think those, you know, those folks are incredibly bright, and really smart. Um, they're just, they're, they're looking back and saying, I can't in good conscience invest capital right now, but I can't see visibility. Whereas a private investor, you know, if the three of us decided to go pool our own money together to invest in a deal, you know, we're big boys. We can we can take that risk because we have conviction and it's our money. Uh, when when you have other people's money per se, um, you certainly got to be even more strongly convicted. That being said, I mean, markets are getting deals done. I mean, we did a deal in Salt Lake City where thirty seven million dollars of equity went into a deal on a highest priced per key hotel ever built in the history of the state. Um, and I think that was about conviction, about what they believed uh, where this asset will look and be in, in the next five to 10 years, because there's a lot of, you know, I like to call it the tax efficient states versus the tax inefficient states. I don't want to get political, right? The reality is the tax efficient states are kicking the ass of tax inefficient states right now. And so if you were to tell me, can we get an equity deal done in a tax efficient state 
through a family office or, or other avenues that are not the institutional partners, um, that is a much higher likelihood than in a tax inefficient state. Um, you know, when I think about pushing deals in California, you know, there's a lot of questions right now. Um, you know, we all live here. We love it here. But reality is the capital markets don't love it nearly like we do um, from an investment thesis. So, you know, those are other things to pay attention to. I mean, the growth in these markets is extreme. I mean, Florida's growth from, a, I mean, the number of people that have moved to Florida in the last two years um, is the size of Indianapolis. Uh, you know, the reality is it's amazing to see that. So, those are things no, it, is, it, it, it is incredible. I mean, California lost 500,000 jobs yeah. uh, last year. Um, I think we closed over $5 billion of transactions in, right. in the real estate department and well over two thirds of our deals were outside of California and they were in the states that what would you say tax efficient states. So. <laughs> if you look at the state of Arizona, 2.5% state income tax, Nevada, zero, Texas, yeah. zero, Florida, zero, Tennessee, relatively zero, except for an LLC transfer. Um, you know, those are states are kicking butt. And now we've got ULA coming into the city of LA in about 30, 30 days. So, uh, by the way, if it, I, look, I'm not a proponent of ULA at all, but if it weren't for ULA, uh, I would have a lot fewer transactions because of ULA. Yeah. It's yeah. artificial, it's artificial right. um, transactions that we need to close and clear by March 31st. Yeah. Uh, but it is what's keeping uh, a few of us here busy. Um, are you guys ready for the, Real talk, lightning round set of questions. Well, look, I solved my issue with my 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 dinging on my my computer, so I can do anything. <laughs> you can do it. You, you great. I got you stayed in a rebel here. Let's go. <laughs> and you stayed in a Motel Six last night, so so you're good. Um, all right. I always start with this lightning round question. If you weren't in the real estate industry, what would you guys be doing? Ooh. You weren't in the real estate industry. Man, you stumped me because I, I like being You must not industry. listen to real talk because that is my first question <laughs> of the lightning round. I, I, I would mean, love to be, I would, I would have loved to have been a professional athlete. I would, if I had the talent, I would have loved it. Uh, I don't even care if I would be the, the, the last guy sitting at the end of the bench as a you know 12th man or whatever on a basketball team, but I would have loved to have been a professional athlete. See, Malcolm, if I had your height, I would yeah. have been a professional athlete. That's where it's good to be. You're making me feel really good. You're making me feel really good. You wasted, you wasted your six foot four frame. <laughs> I know. I Zach and I hey. we couldn't do anything with our five foot seven, five yeah, foot eight. I, you know, I will say you are better athletes. I've seen you guys play sports, so you guys are very uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. And we didn't we didn't run in high school, not like you, from what I hear. But it didn't even dawn because I love tennis, so I'd love to be a professional tennis player. But come on, man, it's a five seven, Jew five seven Jewish guy. That ain't happening. So I'd say I don't know, man. Maybe therapist. And I feel like that's that's sort of a part of our job. Is there's a big psychological yeah. kind of component to what it is that we do beyond kind of the numbers? Um, is is really about kind of bringing people together and and, and getting them to the point where they feel like okay. This this makes sense for us, and and we should do this, and we should move forward. So you're kind of helping them in a way, and you know I think I'd probably do that. Try and help people, um, you know, push through some of their issues and their personal lives, and you know get them to a better place. Not exactly yeah. apples to apples, but some similarities. Yeah, amazing because that's what I do with Zach every day. You know, I, I, <laughs> that's why you, that's why you have a couch in in the office. Um, Damn right. Yeah. So you guys are not just uh, in the real estate industry, but you are entrepreneurs and you have your own company. So what is one of the biggest challenges that you weren't expecting that sort of surfaced in your 10 months of of being at the top of Way Capital that you think to yourself, wow, I didn't realize that with respect to running a company? Who's going first? Uh, look, I, I would, I would just say, you know, when you, when you, I mean, I, I was a developer, so I had, you know, the, all the, the, the issues of, you know, uh, having a company and, and personnel and the like, I mean, everybody has challenges with, with personnel, I, I would say, but, but honestly, like the biggest thing is just when you own a business and open up a business in California, California is just not easy. Uh, you know, they don't make it easy on small businesses. So I would just say that, you know, when you get your, you know, insurance policies and all the things that you think that should be easy to get. You know, they make it kind of hard on you. Uh, and so I would say that was a surprise. Um, and I would just say one thing for me that I feel like in our business, we haven't changed really our ethos or who we are. But to the outside world, 
it really feels like they see and understand us a lot more clearly when you have your own company. Um, and I always, it just surprises me a bit because, you know, I'm like, hey, it's the same guy. I'm the same person. But I, they clearly see Zach and I certainly differently than we were just being in a partnership like we were before. And so in that regard, I think that was really the biggest surprise for me was just how I think I'm viewed, I think, from the yeah. outside. Um, I would agree with that, uh, even with respect to my uh, my firm. Uh, Zach, do you want to take that question? Yeah, and remember, I, it's lightning round answers. Yeah, lightning answers. Um, probably didn't realize the amount of time you need to spend on just platform stuff. And it's everything. Yeah. It's personnel, it's insurance, it's HR, it's, I mean, gosh, legal agreements, it's everything. So that that was probably more more than I thought it would be. Um, and I think other things is just, I, yeah, I agree with Malcolm, the way we're seen and and just the reception that we've gotten in the market has been incredibly warm and, and also overwhelming by, by, I think, the number of people just reaching out to us. Um, you know, and I, I think part of that's just a tough market and we're, known as the guys that can get tough deals done. But I think a lot of that is just sort of the way we've sort of marketed, branded, and really positioned ourselves. Um, and just done that consistently, let people know, hey, you're an entrepreneurial sponsor doing an institutional level deal between call it, I don't know, 30 million and 200 million. We want to talk to you. And hopefully you want to talk to us too. And we've gotten just a ton of those inquiries. And then it's figuring out, okay, you know, where, where can you be dangerous and picking your spots? Uh, I probably should have ended with that question because that would have been a great segue. But I, I do have a couple others that are specific to real estate. The asset class that a sponsor brings to you where you're like, you know what? I can definitely get this done. One asset class that far and away is, I don't want to say nothing is easy, but easier to place capital into. Office. <laughs> I mean, look, to be no, kidding. It's not golden it's child. It's, yeah. The golden child of the world are industrial and multifamily. And those, those two assets classes have been remarkable. I would say in the multifamily market that we've just been really proud of our success and is actually hitting all the niches. Um, everything from doing built for rent, single family rental communities around the U.S., you know, to ho hotel to multifamily conversions or are doing the we like to call them urban suite projects in the coasts and the, the, high, the urban markets. But, you know, otherwise people call them co-living. Um, you know, those are really niches within multi. And I would say that those niches are really needed. I mean, when you think about, we have too many hotels in America probably built that are old hotels. Um, we have, a, you know, and we call it attainable housing, affordable housing crisis, as people say. Um, those hotels are fantastic opportunities for um, really attainable housing solutions. And so are co-living in the, you know, in Los Angeles. And, and frankly, the, the, the real growth of the single family rental communities around the U.S. are just a desire of having that ability to have four walls not connected to other people and not having to go up and down stairs and having a little backyard, you know, it seems that, you know, that's a, that's a pretty logical thing that we'd want to have in the U S because, you know, home ownership isn't something for everybody. And um, that asset class is just booming. Um, in all reality costs are so high and interest rates are high, but look, I think that those are the, the we will get any one of those deals and all, all the time, all done. You know um, we, we, there's nothing that we think we can't do. We're just candid about, you know, this, this, the duration of the length that it might take uh, and be being candid about, hey, this is going to be hard. But if you're in it, we're in it together as well. Um, it might take a little time, but we'll, we'll push forward. All right. Last question. What would you guys sitting here today uh, tell the 25 year old version of yourself advice that you wish you would have gotten uh, when you were a 25 year old? Zach, why don't you start? I'll start. Um, stay hungry, but also be patient. Like this is a long game. Like if you're, you know, probably in any business, but definitely in the commercial real estate business, you gotta, you gotta just stay patient and stay hungry. Um, and, and you know, the two are not uh, exclusive or exclusionary in any way. But things take longer than than you think they will, especially when you're 25 and when you're working at an industry that's probably never been faster or speedier to do things than it is now, but it's still a slow industry. Like, you know, just the kind of segment of a transaction we're in, for example, it can be, you know, anywhere from, I don't know, six months to a year. And that's just one piece of it before it closes, let alone everything that has to happen post-closing and before something's eventually stabilized and sold. 
Um, so you've got to stay patient and realize that these are large and complex transactions and things take a long time. And look, building a skill base and building a knowledge base takes a long time. And like, that's OK. It's OK for things to take a while. It's OK not to know things. Um, don't let that in any way dampen your your hunger, your energy, your proactivity. Just just realize that that is what it takes. And if you can stay patient and hungry, you're, you're going to come out ahead. Um, and especially in times like this. Right. If you're facing a time like this where it's volatile in the capital markets and you're 25, and I know this was lightning round, but it's when I started, I started in January of 08. That's when I got my first job in real estate. Um, I wish somebody would have told me that. I think it would have taken me further. Uh, mine's easy. I think if somebody had said, you know, in the business, you, you have to have some gravitas to succeed in commercial real estate. I think you have to have a lot of energy and you've got to push forward. And that you straddle the line of, of cocky and confident. Um, right. And the reality is you want to be on the side of confidence and have humility. And if I could have had more humility and understood that, that humility will take you very far in life. Um, when you're 25, you kind of like have to, if you're going to be going for it, you got to straddle the line of being, you know, cocky and arrogant and confident, but a little bit of humility along the way probably would help you in some of your decision making. Uh, and so some of my decision making back then was a little too aggressive uh, on, on the risk side of the spectrum. Uh, and I think also I was probably a little too arrogant and too cocky. Um, so a little humility was smacked into me in 2008, 2009. And I'm forever grateful for that because uh, I'm much more happy. I'm a much happier person today because of that. Well, it's all because of Zach. <laughs> well, on a, on a serious note, guys, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I, I'm so um, I, I'm really so proud to see you guys uh, and the success of Way Capital. And I know I was joking around at the parties at um, IMN and the other festivities that we've that I've been you know, humbly invited to and 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 we share a lot of clients and uh, I know how they um feel about you guys and way capital and the added value that that you guys provide and especially in today's market where it's extremely challenging to fight to find not just capital but the right capital that will be there at the closing table um thanks for coming on guys best of luck and um congratulations to all your success uh, to this date so far thanks, thanks andrew, andrew. Congrats, right, guys. Take care. Too. I know your new career now. Yeah, yeah for sure. I'm a full-time <laughs> podcaster and, and youth sports coach and part-time lawyer. I love it. All right. See you, right, guys. Take Bye. care. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Real Talk, Real Estate Discussions with Andrew Kirsch. You can catch prior episodes at scholarkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and for sharing this show with others.